welcome to the Transforming Trauma Podcast. Transforming Trauma is presented by the NARM Training Institute. I'm your host, Emily Ruth, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. Hi, Transforming Trauma listeners. We're thrilled to share with you that the new NARM book was just released. The Practical Guide for Healing Developmental Trauma, Using the Neuroaffective Relational Model to Address Adverse Childhood Experiences and Resolve Complex Trauma, is written by our very own NARM creator, Dr. Lawrence Heller, and NARM senior trainer, Brad Kammer. This book is designed to promote personal and collective change. The intention is to make NARM accessible for anyone working or dealing with complex trauma. Using therapeutic examples and helpful exercises, Brad and Larry demonstrate how NARM can serve as a catalyst to promote healing and post-traumatic growth. Whether you are a mental health or other helping professional, or simply interested in personal growth, we hope you will find this book useful in your professional work and personal healing. The Practical Guide for Healing Developmental Trauma is available for pre-order now on Amazon and other online book retailers. Please visit narmtraining.com forward slash books to stay up to date on the latest news, promotions, and giveaways. Hi, Transforming Trauma listeners. For our episode today, we're delighted to share with you a special glimpse into the NARM Inner Circle. The NARM Inner Circle is an online learning program for those interested in joining an international community of helping professionals who are passionate about healing complex trauma. The Inner Circle provides ongoing, in-depth learning from the NARM creator, Dr. Lawrence Heller, and senior trainer, Brad Kammer, as well as other NARM faculty. As a gift to our listeners, we offer this special topic webinar when folks from all around the world gathered to learn more about healing complex trauma with the focus of the discussion being upon intergenerational love. Larry and Brad talk about intergenerational love from a NARM perspective and what this term can mean for helping professionals in the trauma field. They touch on topics like the paradox of trying to feel love, the distinction between unconditional love and trying to be loved, as well as the relationship between love and hope. Larry and Brad also introduce several self-reflection exercises to support your own learning process. We invite you to pause the episode and take time to reflect during the exercises if you wish. We hope you enjoy this special episode of Transforming Trauma. This is our last webinar for 2021 of the Inner Circle and had some great topics this year. It's been really interesting and I've enjoyed putting these together with you, Larry, and also just, you know, doing these together and getting the feedback from everyone, from all of you. Uh So this is a nice topic to end on. I know I was watching some of your postmasters training and you got into some of these themes as well. So it'd be interesting to hear from this perspective on intergenerational love. Yeah, we thought it would be a good topic to end the year on because it's often not talked about this intergenerational love. And it's such a huge resource for all of us. And what you'll hear us talk about is that none of us would really be here if there wasn't some love that we experienced somewhere along the way. So Brad and I will be expanding on that as we go. here. Yeah. So we like to start with a reflective exercise and we invite you to join us in taking a few moments to reflect on some loving moments that you might have had in your family of origin. Even if you have to go to extended family members or even friends or anyone else that has been loving towards you. And as you reflect on this, we're going to invite you to just take a few moments to notice your internal experience. I just want to remind people that um, this kind of an exercise is actually something we use as part of the NARM model. We don't just focus on what went wrong in people's lives. We also focus on you know, those elements that worked or were supportive or where there was actual, you know, love and encouragement and, you know, those kinds of things communicated to the child. And we like to then deconstruct even the positive elements in a person's life as we'll, Brad and I will be talking a little bit about today. So we'll start from the beginning because this term isn't maybe the most common term. So maybe we can talk a little bit about from an arm perspective, what do we mean by intergenerational love? Well, It's easier for those of you who are parents out there, and I'm assuming that probably most of the parents that are on our, if not all of the parents who are on our, you know, webinars here are doing the best you can to be loving and good parents with your children. But I'm sure those of you who are parents have felt love towards your children. That's generally the experience. 
it's not universal, but it's generally the experience. And the very fact that you have this capacity to love your own children or other people in your lives, if you don't have children, means that in some way you're carrying on this intergenerational love. It's like there is love that exists separate, of course, you know, from a more spiritual perspective, separate from what's communicated by the family. But so often what is or isn't communicated by the family of origin has such a big impact on all of us to be able to recognize those elements as part of our world and as part of our life. Well, we're going to start just going off on a tangent from the beginning here, but I'm curious, like, you know, you started off in the, I think in the seventies as a therapist and from the beginning of your journey, what were some of the windows into becoming interested for you in bringing some of these, this understanding of the love aspect, the intergenerational love into the work that you were developing? Well, one of the things that I noticed, and I'm sure, you know, those who've been in our trainings is that I was in situations where people were opening and up and being vulnerable. It was just interesting to me to feel kind of heart space that would be present when a group of people with a similar intention get together and share really from a heart level their hurts and their joys and the whole piece. And I didn't grow up in a culture where those things were talked about that much. It wasn't a joyless culture or an unloving culture, but it wasn't talked about. But to be in the situations where then people started to talk about it, I started to see this theme of love that is always there underneath, you know, all of the adaptations to trauma that we've made. And I started just to see how important it was not to leave that out of the therapeutic process because it sustains us all in different ways. Love, I mean. Were you finding this in the psychological world at all? No. It's really interesting, isn't it? as we both know, how little, how seldomly, you know, this is discussed. Now, there have been occasional exceptions, but it's not been part of the general psychological psychotherapeutic narrative. And it's amazing since it's such a basic human interest and wish and desire, and so essential to who we are as human beings, that this is not talked about in traditional psychology or psychotherapy. It's kind of mind boggling in a certain way to me. I remember about 20 years ago now, I was going to teach my first college course ever taught. And I got the textbook, you know, 500 page textbook. And I went through it and there was literally no mention of love in that textbook. 500 pages of psychology. They talked about things like affiliation or, (laughs) you know, like they talked about more from a behavioral perspective, but they didn't talk about it from the emotional perspective. Well, I think there's been this attempt to be scientific and how do you examine love under a microscope? You know, it it really is. It's been a huge, from I think our point of view, a huge failure on the part of the psychological and psychotherapeutic world to really not address this thing. It feels very vulnerable sometimes, like when, you know, people are asking about NARM and we're talking about it, it is so heart centered Mm -hmm. and it feels a little vulnerable sometimes about like, how do we describe NARM from that place to people that really are coming from a very different perspective? And I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. It it is a question that gets brought up less about the love piece, more about just like, how do we talk about NARM? But I noticed the heartfulness, the heart center of it. I always minimize that or even avoid it sometimes because it feels vulnerable to share that with people that don't share that perspective. Well, strangely enough, it can be triggering for people. And for some people that go quickly into their heads and start making all kinds of meaning out of that. And it sounds airy fairy and not grounded, let's say, but It's the most grounding thing there is, actually, in my experience. So I just think it has to do with the challenge that we've experienced culturally in many senses, in many respects, and and in in many of our families about just being in our hearts and expressing ourselves from that level. So this leads us perfectly into this next question is what's the interface between intergenerational love and trauma? Well, those of you who've been with us for a while and or in the trainings, you know that we talk about the child's fear of the loss of the attachment relationship. And I actually made a conscious choice to change it from love. I used to just primarily talk about the child's fear of loss of love. And then but I was teaching this before the attachment work got really well known. And then as the attachment work got more in everybody's consciousness, I started talking about attachment or the fear of the loss of the attachment love or the relationship. But then at a certain point, I realized that I was like, you were just talking about bypassing this piece about love that brings it down to a 
a very human level. Again, attachment is more on a behavioral level. It's not on this emotional, and, and we obviously and normally see heart as, as an emotion, but something even a state that is actually deeper than an emotion. And so when I was going through these various phases of, you know, how best to communicate this, I went from love to attachment, and then back to love and attachment. So now, Brad, you and I, we make a point when possible in our writing and when we're creating these webinars and such to bring both into the picture because they're both important. Because here's another way to look at that, what we so often call the fear of the loss of the attachment relationship. You know, we talk about the child's need for splitting when they're really angry and filled with rage towards the parents. That's so threatening because it threatens not just the attachment relationship, but it threatens the love relationship. It feels like anger, the very powerful energies of anger are going to drown out any kind of feeling love, love, they'll lose love. And that would mean then if they disconnect from love, there's no love left in the universe. And that for a child is catastrophic. So it's important as we're kind of building this in. And that's what Brad and I had in mind today is to just to remind ourselves and our clients that there's also been love there in our lives somewhere. And it's often useful, particularly for people who've been extremely traumatized and very early trauma, to find whatever little oases of loving experiences or loving people that they had in their lives. In the first book, I talked a lot about grandmothers because I saw that in my practice so often is that the child might have grown up in a very dysfunctional, sometimes abusive family. Often, of course, not always, but often there was a healthy grandmother who held a different kind of space for her grandchildren that made such a huge difference. So she played this role in the lives of these children to remind them that, yeah, love does exist in the world. And just that little bit of hopefulness in a child's life that it might be an experience, you know, once every Sunday, or maybe even less often, or whatever it might be in any given family. But just to know that that's a possibility in this life helps children hold out when, again, from a child's perspective, the younger they are, the more true this is, but that whatever they're experiencing that moment in a child's mind seems like that's the way it's going to be forever. And so when they have these alternative experiences of love, this sets up a whole healing dynamic and the potential for healing much later in life when they're doing their work. So when we talk about with developmental trauma, there's, you know, it's really a heartbreak. It's like the early attachment failures leads to us having the disconnect from our heart. We're really talking about the loss of love for a child, which is like you said, catastrophic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly really in every case. And we see then often the adaptive survival styles are just strategies to be loved. If I don't make myself too visible, if I make myself invisible, then maybe at least I'll be tolerated and loved. It may not even come into the picture for people with a connection survival style. And individuals with the attunement survival style will, if I'm not too demanding, if I don't ask for too much, then I'll be loved. And on and on this goes for the autonomy survival style. If I don't speak up, if I don't say no, if I don't set limits, then I'll be loved. So all of these survival style strategies are really strategies to be loved and putting it in very human terms. Then it starts to really make sense much more about why then our adult relationships, there's so much charge. It's like they're such high stake. The example I use in my teaching a lot is like when I used to work with couples and they would come in and had a huge fight around the dishes. It's like, you know, it wasn't the dishes that was the issue, but it's like it triggers not just their attachment patterns you're saying here, but about like in that moment when someone is not feeling seen or heard or respected, it goes straight back to the heart and the fear that there's going to be loss of love. So, I mean, you really just touched on, you know, you talked about intergenerational love and trauma and you touched on this narcissistic theme, as I've been talking about advanced in the immersion course, that narcissism really, and the, the adaptations that we make that are narcissistic, the adaptive self or the false self, as is traditionally called in psychology, is there basically to get love. And all of the hurt that we feel, just like you described, when we're not seen and not heard, not met, not understood, ultimately are connected to, you know, you said it, but it's worth repeating. It's connected to the loss of love. Just before we move on, I know years ago you recommended to me a book, A General Theory of Love. Mm -hmm. Is that something you'd still recommend? Absolutely. If you don't know this book, 
It's a wonderful book. It's written by three neuropsychiatrists, which doesn't sound promising, (laughs) seriously. (laughs) But not only is it the best human understanding of attachment that I've read, it's written with a kind of poetry. It's a small little book. I can't remember how many pages, but not many. I think you could probably read it in an hour and a half or two hours. And it's really touches on this theme of love and the importance for us as human beings. We've started to kind of scratch the surface at this, but if you could talk a little bit more about what is the paradox of trying to be loved? Well, trying to be loved is the survival style strategy. And if you're trying to be loved, by definition, you're at that moment, at least not feeling loved. Mm. So when you're working hard to be loved, to you know, foreclose aspects of yourself in order to be loved or to act in certain ways in order to be loved, by definition, you're not feeling loved because you're feeling like you have to earn it. This might bump up against a slide that's coming later, but I have this curiosity about how much of this, we do have a slide on this later, but how much of this relates to the way we've internalized our relationship to like even feeling receptive of love from our early environment and then how we relate to ourselves through that. Well, and, you know, it goes back to kind of NARM 101, but, you know, as we've talked about it in different contexts, for the child, it's always personal. And to not experience the love they need, and as we've talked about, it's better to be an unlovable child with loving parents than a lovable child whose parents don't have the capacity for love. And so the child will make themselves wrong, they'll make themselves unlovable, and that becomes then a part of the distorted self-concept that then can inform the whole rest of their lives if they never get enough, if the person never gets an opportunity to work through this. And then love is always conditional and it's always based on, you know, performance and looks and other kinds of elements. And from that perspective, you'll never get there. It's got a built-in frustration to it because even if people respond positively to the persona that we create, on some level, we're telling ourselves, well, if they really knew me, Mm -hmm. they wouldn't love me. So it's got a built-in contradiction. I mean, it's important to understanding, but it's just cognitive. The real work is on an emotional level of working through the distorted self-image of not being lovable, of being defective, and all of the things that children end up doing to themselves in order to manage and make sense of the world that they find themselves in. So again, that efforting, the trying to be loved isn't in itself an obstacle in the way of actually receiving love. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because Again, if you're efforting and you're being seen positively for that, that's what gets the credit, (laughs) the efforting. You just mentioned this before, but just maybe a little bit more on this distinction between unconditional love and trying to be loved. I can't remember now. I've said this in a webinar recently, but it's worth repeating. When I was working with clients, I would use this little story to help them understand something, what it was that they were actually doing to themselves, which of course is a reflection of what was done to them. But this story where... You're looking at your child, they're two months old, and you look down and you say, oh, sweetheart, you know, I don't love you now, but if you grow up and you are beautiful or handsome or perfect looking, if you get very good grades, if you're a success in life, if you never make mistakes, if you never upset me, if you do everything, then I'll love you. I could go on and on with that list forever, but this is what families do. Mm -hmm. And this is what we internalize. And this is what we do to ourselves. And when we're doing that to ourselves, then everything takes on, you know, all this added charge, because that means if we make a mistake, Mm -hmm. it's not just a mistake. If we've got that dynamic, it means that evokes in us the fear that we're not going to be loved. If we feel that we don't look quite right, there's something wrong with our bodies. It's not just that there may be, or it may not be something wrong with our bodies, but in any case, it means that we're not going to be loved if we've got a physical defect, real or perceived, and on and on. We could go through all the survival styles, really all the struggles that, well, maybe not all, but a significant amount of the struggles that humanity gets into around this theme of being loved. Yeah. There's something about the unconditional love and how that relates to NARM. And you see, part of in NARM, it's really important that we don't take sides in mm. a person's internal struggle. We mm. don't become cheerleaders. We might know, for example, that they've got a lot of unresolved anger and that it will be useful for them when they get there, but we don't cheerlead for them to get into their anger because on a, a deeper level, the other part of them that is afraid of the anger is feeling rejected. And we can take that template and apply it across the board to so many things that we can subtly in 
psychotherapy takes sides with the client's internal struggle. And when we do that, we're missing usually the part of them that is doing whatever dysfunctional behavior or having whatever dysfunctional perspective on themselves. They're doing that out as a way of trying to be loved and trying to make sense of not being loved. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad we went there because, uh, you know, I know we've done previous webinars on managed empathy, but it's something that I see when people first come into NARM, there's a struggle with this. There's just, It's one thing to kind of hear you or I or the training assistants kind of say that. It's another thing to really embody that. And, you know, I wonder if you have any just words of wisdom about for those of us that like, it sounds good to like hold this certain kind of complexity and neutrality with our clients. And then all of a sudden we're there and we just want to like make them feel better or give them what they want. And anything that you can kind of share that might be a helpful reminder for those of us when we're in those situations. Well, the other thought that I, that I had as we were talking about this is that in NARM, I made a very purposeful intention to build in acceptance of all parts of ourselves, which by definition is leading us in the direction of first unconditional acceptance, which is the next step away from unconditional love. And then of course, other elements of like compassion come in for when we're struggling and that gets accepted too. So this acceptance that is at the heart of NARM, accepting all of the different parts of ourselves, this is actually really in a certain way, a path of love, you know, a path towards increasing yeah, heartfulness. We haven't talked yet about hope. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about hope. Well, we could talk about it, you know, from a child's perspective and children are very good at finding resources in the world. It might be a grandparent. It might be the parent of one of their friends. It might be a teacher. It might be somebody, you know, in their church. Children will look a variety of places to get what they want and they feel at home and safe and all kinds of things when they can experience it. But if they don't find it, they lose hope. When children can't get the attachment they need, when they can't get the love that they need, they do, they get hopeless, and then they get extremely symptomatic. They'll act in or act out or all kinds of different ways to try and manage their internal states. And that's as a child. But even as an adult, when we feel disconnected from love, we start to feel hopeless. That's how central the heart and love is in the human situation. It's not a surprising that it's the subject of just about every popular song out there, movies, plays, literature. And yet, how can we ignore it so much in our field? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I've mentioned this before on a webinar, but I was trained in heart math. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they've done a lot of studies on the heart and, you know, they focus a lot on heart rate variability and things like this. But it's, it is interesting that there hasn't been much more research about the heart in connection to social engagement. And then also things like heart disease and, you know, the link between when we actually have to armor our heart, like what that does to the literal organ of our heart and the functioning of our body and brain. Yeah. And as many of you know, we always in NARM talk about the functional unity between the psychological or the emotional and the physiological. And of course, the, the heart that we talk about when we're talking about love is more than just the physical organ, but it's not just a coincidence that it also involves the physical organ because we feel it there. And actually there's some indication as a response to trauma and abuse and various other kinds of things that literally we contract in the pericardium, you know, the sac that surrounds the heart. There is literally a contraction of the heart. And we know too, from more advanced bodywork systems that you can actually have contraction in the organs themselves. We usually think of contraction just on a muscular level, but it's much more than that. And we can have contraction in the heart and in response to loss of love and loss of connection and trauma. And we can contract in all the organ systems of the body, including the central nervous system. And it has a systemic disconnecting and losing the hope of love has a systemic impact on human beings. So we thought we would do it a little different this time and do an exercise, a reflective exercise in the middle, just because this topic is so rich emotionally. So uh, we'd like to invite you to take a few moments at this point to reflect on, have you ever felt truly loving towards another human being? And as you reflect on this to, again, just notice your internal experience. Larry, did you want to say anything about the exercise? Well, just Brad and I talked about this and obviously it's optimal if you could access 
that experience in yourself of feeling loving towards another human being. There are some people out there, and maybe there's some people in the group watching this who have difficulty finding that. And then we might have said, you know, and that's where the animals can come in, for example, that often we feel this kind of unconditional love toward and with our dogs, for example, or our cats. And that's better than nothing. Love is love. So that's why there's all these studies that show that people recover more quickly when they've got a pet. They suffer from less depression when they've got a pet. There are a whole array of symptoms that diminish just by having a pet. And it seems to me that that has to do with this theme of love, is that they feel loved by their and accepted by their dog, and they love and accept their dog unconditionally, even when their dog can be a pain in the butt sometimes. Years ago, I was at a training with a bunch of vets, you know, a trauma training, and there was a lot of animals there because there was a whole thing about animal assisted therapy veterans that are dealing with trauma, PTSD. The energy was so loving, you know, of these people that were really broken physically and emotionally in a lot of ways too. And yet you could see the way that they had this relationship with dog. They were all dogs, I believe, but there was a lot of love in the field. And I, I remember just kind of that sense of that experience. So. You talked a little bit at the beginning about parenting and or about intimate relationships and anything more you wanted to say about this as a reflection of intergenerational love. Well, again, just that we're, you know, we're of course drawing on resources that maybe we've worked on and developed, but ultimately we wouldn't have had enough hope to come into therapy to work on that if we hadn't experienced some love growing up in whatever way, you know, Brad and I have been kind of pointing to today. But if we're able to love our children, and our, our partner, it means that in some way or another, we've embodied that in ourselves. Even if, you know, we have difficult moments with that and all of the baggage that can come with relationships, all the challenges that can come with relationships, we want to continue to, in this webinar, to bring people's focus to the fact that there's also always been love there. So we don't talk so much about self-loving in NARM, and can you explain more from that perspective? I've always had a problem with this concept of loving myself, the way I said that good sound, I was talking generically, but of this concept of self-love, because it brings up this, for me at least, it brings up this subject-object split. Now, I'm fine, and we do talk about self-acceptance, because then there's what we're doing and the way we're feeling, and then we can accept that. But self-loving, self-loving is in my perspective, experienced by being ourselves. It comes out of self-acceptance. It comes out of compassion for the suffering that we've had. But when it's there, it's not like I'm here loving myself over there. It's just that I'm true to my heart and my heart is the center of my life and my relationship with myself and my relationship with other people. And it's expressed in that way and not in this subject-object dynamic. So would it be accurate to say that it's similar to like the way that we differentiate between states and behaviors in NARM? Like you're trying to describe a state versus some kind of behavior. Yeah, that's a really good way of putting it, Brad, because self-acceptance, it's kind of in between a state and a behavior, yeah. but it is partly a behavior. Yeah. You know? It's a particular attitude that we're holding towards, you know, a mistake that we made or whatever it might have been. But the state of love is just that. It's a state. And then it includes ourselves. It includes our family. It includes our friends. It can include the world, you know, where we've hopefully had moments where we felt our hearts were so open and overflowing that we felt love and compassion towards, you know, all living beings. And, you know, those experiences, of, if you've had them, are truly transformative. This is another one. I don't have a very clear question, but I'll just ask it the way it's coming. It's like, why is this important for us to understand this concept? Like that we don't use the concept of self-love. Can you help us understand like why? Yeah. Cause again, I think what you hinted at before you really mentioned is that it turns it into a behavior and it's so much more than a behavior. Then it's an active process. I love myself. There's me There's you know, that whole split. And in a certain way, it, it maintains a split. And Honestly, when I've heard people use that, I've often felt that that really indicated just the opposite, 
that it was something that they was like an overlay, something that they were trying to do. Well, I'm working really hard on loving myself these days. Well, I don't know what that means when somebody says that. Now, if they're saying I'm working on being more accepting of myself, that makes sense to me. But the other part, it's just really the embodiment of love, which then includes ourselves and everyone else. There's a saying, I'm not quoting you exactly, but you say something about like, you can't legislate internal states. Right. Something about that here. Like you can't make these very deep internal states happen in that right. way. That's true. And that was a pretty direct quote. <laughs> <So> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's useful to see what it means is that, you know, we can't will ourselves to love somebody else, but love does happen under the right circumstances, both external and internal circumstances, when we're prepared to allow ourselves internally to go there. And when there's somebody who, for a variety of reasons, which is often, you know, coming from a number of different places, but is somebody that we then direct our love toward. And that aspect of intimate and interpersonal and human love is very important. There's more to the theme of love than that, but that's a huge and important start. And many spiritual systems actually tend to bypass personal love, you know, and focus more on divine love. And in some ways, it's actually easier to love God than it is to love another human being yeah. with all the difficulties, you know, that relationships bring. So learning this capacity for human love is on the step towards something more for those people who are inclined in that direction, rather than vice versa. Although we start with wherever a person is. If a person has had a spiritual experience, we can help them build on that and experience that in more human, more personal, and more interpersonal situations. So uh, can you give us a, maybe a few more examples of how these themes related to intergenerational love might show up clinically? Well, many times, as I'm sure you and the therapists you know, who are watching have experiences that we're working on a, an issue with a client. And they've been focusing on an area where they were really hurt. But then as they don't run away from their hurt and they start to feel more, and, and instead of the child position that they had been in, which is blaming themselves for their own hurt and their own suffering, as they start to open up to that, then often we'll be able to see also other people in their life who've communicated a certain kind of acceptance to them. And as I've talked about also in other contexts, for our really, really traumatized clients, you as the therapist may be the very first accepting kind person that they've had any kind of close connection with. And for those people who've just, you know, in other words, barely made it because there was really so little to draw on in their, in their upbringing, you as the therapist become a huge resource. And I know therapists become worried that, well, maybe they're just going to depend on me for that. But dependence is a more a behavior. It's like clients can actually borrow from your loving state. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, we, Brad and I talk so much about doing our own personal work in this so that we can't take people in themselves. We can't go to in ourselves, you know, personally. And so they will then experience you as that loving object, and they begin to internalize that. And then ultimately that connects them to that capacity that has never not been there in them, but they've just been so disconnected from it that it, they didn't realize that. It's one of the things I used to really love about work when I used to work with kids is just, you know, kids that are growing up in these environments where they have not had one safe adult and often not one safe male adult. And when I was working with them, you could see them like trying to process this experience in a certain way. They might be behaviorally having reactions, you know, but you could see that there was something happening that was very significant. And we used to talk a lot at the agency I worked at about just like kind of planting seeds. Like, you know, if they had one person, you know, when they were eight years old or whatever that was, that really held a certain kind of space for them, even though their environment was full of abuse and substance abuse and terror and all those things, mm -hmm. that can plant a seed that can become really a huge resource later on for them. Absolutely. It reminds me of an experience. I know I've actually never talked about this. I thought about it as you were talking is that I spent a little bit of time in a township in South Africa, which is basically these huge camps is another way to put it. And I was in a school with these orphaned children. So these were children who had all experienced loss of their parents, incredible trauma. They were, of course, very, very shy at first, but when they sensed that you were a safe mm -hmm. and 
maybe even a loving person, it would be like they would just open up and they would be like sponges and then they would be all over you. <laughs> you know, it was interesting just to watch that shift from this contracted, pulled back, scared place to when they see, okay, maybe this person has what, of course, don't consciously know, but what they instinctively have been looking for, they just go to it and they haven't gotten, had time to develop so much hardness and armoring that they don't take it in because then they would just, you know, really let themselves take it in. And of course, there would be in, the, in all of these situations, one and one makes three because, you know, whatever loving state I was bringing, which was evoked particularly strongly in this traumatized situation would affect them. And then their openness towards me would affect me. And I feel even more in my heart and would sometimes would even get emotional that here are these children that were learning literally one of the first things that they learn is how to duck to roll and run because there's so many fires in these townships that you know the tenements and what we might call tenements that go up in flames so quickly again this is this basic trauma and yet despite all of this when there's the possibility of love they open up it's just again it's a, i think a lesson in how significant this theme is for us as human beings this takes us a little bit full circle to the beginning but you know i, I always look up to hospice care, hospice workers, and so much love and support and safety generally in those situations with people mm -hmm. that are hospice support workers. And yet, like in our hospitals, it's so lacking. You know, it's like once end of life starts happening, often people can meet their patients or the people that they're working with from this much more heartfelt place. And I started having thoughts recently from an arm perspective about like, is there something about the efforting, you know, that's happening in hospitals? I mean, I know it's complicated. There's a lot of systemic issues, but like just the efforting that in some way, when you're focusing just on the objects of the, the heart or the cancer or whatever that is, it's like we're losing connection to the human that has the cancer, has the heart issue. And once we surrender that they're not going to live anymore and they move into hospice, then we can be back in relationship without the efforting. And it's something that, you know, to think about in terms of like, you know, cause I know there could be people that work in hospital settings in our community. And just about as we bring NARM into these communities, what are some ways that we can support people that are working in these environments to stay connected more to their heart, even when there's very difficult things happening kind of with the various parts of the physical body. Yeah, that was really well put, Brad, and I completely agree. And the only thing I just want to add to that is that I think it's moving, the efforting is part of the mechanical orientation that we have, you know, that we're so focused on that. And, and I'm not saying that those elements aren't essential, but then we lose the human being, you know, whose life is they're trying to save or whose health they're trying to protect or support. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't really talked too much about this. I mean, you, you scratched the surface a little bit about, about like, we might be the first person that someone's really felt this with, but can you talk more? It, it might be even interesting from your personal experience, like when you're working with clients, yeah, what's the role of love for you when you're sitting in front of a human being that you're working with in NARM? Well, when I'm sitting there, I really am sitting there and paying, I'm tracking my whole experience emotional and bodily experience, but I'm particularly tracking what's going on in my heart. And, you know, so for example, when I hear people being casually cruel to themselves, I feel this little contraction in my heart. But with that, I can also then, it supports me to bring compassion to whatever degree they're available to that, because I feel the suffering of that. And then when a person is open in their heart, that to be open to your suffering has the strong possibility of bringing compassion. And then that supports the compassion that I feel for them. And then as people are really taking this hero's journey into them, their internal experience and exploring areas of vulnerability that they've avoided for, for possibly their whole life, I can't help but feel love in that moment for them and the journey that they're on and the courage to move into areas in themselves that have been so painful and scary. And the client often feels it. And I've gotten the feedback. And sometimes they say, I was looking in your eyes and they look so kind. And that made me feel, you know, so safe. And, but that's just kindness is one quality of love. It comes. And so that loving peace on the interpersonal relational level is important in terms of tracking our own experience of our hearts and love as, again, as part of that therapeutic process. These are all 
significant elements. So again, how little love has been part of the psychological narrative. I can bring, there is one exception though, uh, that I can recommend. It's a very old book, but Eric Fromm in the, I think probably about the twenties or maybe the thirties wrote a book called The Art of Loving. He of course was seen as being very out of tune with other psychoanalysts of his era. Yeah. But uh, his book, I haven't looked at it for a long time, but as I recall it anyway, it seemed to hold up over the test of time. And he was one analyst who particularly talked about love as part of the process. You know, you said something that was really worth repeating because so many of us come into these trainings like NARM to learn model, to learn skills that we can be more effective. And I mean, I heard you just throw it completely on its head before, because when you're sitting there with another human being, with a client, you're really just being present to your experience and specifically to your experience of your heart. Yeah. And that goes back to what you said before about uh, how important it is that we really continue to do our own work mm -hmm. because, you know, to be able to access that level of space when you're sitting with a client that you're able to stay connected to your heart, you can't just show up in a client session and start doing that. I mean, that takes a certain kind of cultivation of self-inquiry and capacity to manage a lot of our own obstacles to be able to really stay connected to our heart. You know, you and I have come back so many times to this, this theme of efforting, and I'm going to do it one more time just because yeah. I think it really fits here. And just remind, you know, at least uh, once before I've talked about Stephen Porges's work, and of course, he's the father of the polyvagal theory, and the vagus innervates one of the most significant areas that it innervates is the heart. And that's part of the social engagement system as well. And as soon as you start to effort, you get this sympathetic autonomic nervous system uptick which takes you out of social engagement. And so that's on a scientific level, looking at the, the practical impact of being heartful, being loving, being compassionate, and all these other heart qualities in the psychotherapeutic process. It's essential. And all of the rest is technique if we don't have that element. Now, if we have that element and we don't have good technique, then we're limited too. So we want to have as, you know, a good understanding of the therapeutic process as we can, but without that human element of, and the heartfulness, it's just a mechanical process. Yeah. So we only have a couple of minutes for this last question, but can you talk a little bit about the connection between love, secure attachment? And we haven't really talked specifically about object constancy yet. Well, object constancy is in a certain way what I'm going to talk about first here in connection to love. And object constancy means basically having the ability to both hold love and an intense anger at the same person, that one doesn't erase the other. So you can be really angry at your child. You can be really angry at your partner, but that doesn't mean that you stop loving them at that moment, at least if you have object constancy. Now, we know that for some people, for individuals with personality disorders, where you've got this strong orientation towards splitting, it is, it's an either or situation. They either love you or they hate you. And when they're hating you, they don't feel the love. And when they're loving you, they don't feel the hate. But in object constancy, it's this capacity to integrate both love and all other emotions in with yourself and with other people. Now, with secure attachment, how, you know, again, how love really, or this theme of love uh, permeates this whole dynamic of attachment is that secure attachment could be just really synonymous for feeling loved and accepted for who you are. And that that's not going to end. Even if you screw up, even if you make a mistake, even if you disappoint, your parents may be disappointed, but they never stop loving you. That's secure attachment. When we know that and when we embody that, that helps us connect to this deep internal state of confidence and trust, without which we really struggle as human beings. So our last reflective exercise here, if you'd like to join us, is a time when you felt most in your heart. And again, and we this just... could be with another person. It could be in nature. It could be a spiritual experience. It could be with your pet. It could be anything. So just any time when you felt most in your heart, and then just to pay attention to how that impacts your internal experience in whatever the situation you remind yourself of. Before we move on to the last logistical slide, I just want to really appreciate you, Larry. It just 
was thinking as I was doing my reflective exercise a little bit about when we first met and Larry was my somatic experiencing teacher. And uh, I remember going into the advanced year of the somatic experiencing training. And what happens is you start to have people from other groups that come together. So they had other trainers. And so I had my small group that had Larry and we had a lot of other people. And I, I we start talking about how we were doing something different than the other people. And I was just thinking back and I'm like, I wonder how much of what we were doing is really holding the humanity in the in the heart that gets lost even in these really wonderful somatic models where we focused so much just on the body but not understanding the subjectivity the humanity the heart of our clients and so i just really want to appreciate you and you know as we're ending this year um just how much you've meant to me and meant to i think so many of us and thank um, you really what you've passed down to us has been just so helpful. And I know a lot of our clients are benefiting in great ways. And we're touching a lot of people through the podcast and through the book that you wrote and the book that we're writing and the book that you wrote in German. And just appreciate all of you also for joining us in this journey together with NARM. Like last thing I want to share is that when I've done this kind of an exercise around love in group, like if this group that's watching now, if we had a chance to the time to go and have everybody talk about an experience like Brad, I mean, yeah, I was just very touched in my heart by your sharing. And also if we'd started listening to people talk about their specific experience, every single time that I've had the opportunity to present that kind of an exercise to a group, it starts creating this incredible kind of heart space in the group itself when people start reminding and you can actually, again, this may seem a little airy fairy, but you feel it in the room. You can actually feel it as people move into their hearts in a, a profound way. And the shift that that brings emotionally, bodily, and really in terms of our entire sense of self. So thanks again, Larry, and to all of you and look forward to being together with you all. Thank you, Brad, for everything, the great collaboration this year and every year. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for today's episode. To find more about our guest and their work, check the show notes or visit us at narmtraining.com slash transforming trauma. The practical guide for healing developmental trauma is available for pre-order now on Amazon and other online book retailers. Please visit narmtraining.com forward slash books to stay up to date on the latest news, promotions, and giveaways. Thanks to Andrea Clunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for producing and editing, to Tori Essex for our album art, and to Brad Kammer for the creation of this podcast. We look forward to building community, connection with you, and changing the world by transforming trauma. Mm -hmm.